Hello students, today we are going to discuss an important aspect of drama or a play that is tragedy. Let us understand the origin of tragedy. M. H. Abrahams in his glossary of literary terms defined tragedy as a term that is broadly applied to literary and especially dramatic representations of serious actions which eventuate in a disastrous conclusion for the protagonist. Nevertheless, the word tragedy is most often used to describe any type of catastrophe or an adversity. Specifically, tragedy deals with a work of art or literature that deals with high seriousness and questions related to the role of man in the cosmos. The word tragedy is derived from Greek goat song, from Trago's song and Aden to sing. The term could have been ascribed either to the prize a goat that was awarded to the dramatists whose plays won in the competitions or to the dress goat skins of the performers or to the goat that was sacrificed during the rituals from which tragedy developed. The plays were attended by majority of the people. A very nominal entry fee was provided by the state for those who could not pay. The ambience near the performances was like a religious ceremony than a mere entertainment. A raised platform for gods with dutiful priests was a common scene. The subjects of the tragedies were the adversities and misfortunes of the heroes of great legends, religious myth or history. Most of the subject matter originated from the works of Homer which were known to almost everybody in the Greek community. Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides were the three most influential Greek dramatists or playwrights. The word they initially used for their plays has not only survived through many ages and centuries but has also described a literary genre that survived and proved its viability through centuries. Why and how tragedy originated and developed through different ages and cultures have been examined and investigated by historians, philologists, archaeologists and anthropologists. Yet, the results are only hypothetical. In fact, the origin of the word tragedy is also far from established. The most widely accepted Source is a Greek tragoida or goat song from Trago's goat and Aden which means to sing. The word could have referred either to a goat which was given as a prize for the best one in the competitions or to the dress goat skins that was worn by the performers or to the goat that was sacrificed during the rituals. During communal rituals and celebrations, a correct dance may have been the first formal and principal element. A speaker was a later entrant, perhaps an extension of the role of the priest. A dialogue was conventional between the priest and the dancers who became the chorus in the Athenian drama. Aeschylus is regarded as a person who after realizing the dramatic possibilities of the dialogue, added a second speaker and thus invented the form of tragedy. Bacchanalia, feats of the Greek god Bacchus or Dionysus, was held annually in Athens. Dionysus held place as a god of vegetation and the wine. Goat was considered sacred to him. It has been surmised that tragedy's roots originated from fertility feasts 
which is celebrated to mark the harvest and the vintage and related ideas of death and regeneration of life. The main reason behind the celebration of these rituals is to put into effect some sway over vital forces of life. Whatever original religious connections of tragedy are, two aspects of tragedy were neither lost nor diluted. They are firstly, its high seriousness, apt to matters in which survival is a main concern. Secondly, its involvement of the entire society in matters of both ultimate as well as common concern. Aeschylus is considered the most theological of all the Greek tragedians. His Prometheus is compared to the book of Job of the Bible, both in its structure and its concern with the problem of suffering at the hands of an unjust deity. Aeschylus tried to resolve the dramatic problem to some extent into harmony. He adopted this in the last two parts of the Prometheus and he unquestionably did in the conclusion of the Oresteia. This tendency would drift him out of the sphere of tragedy and into religious assertion. Nevertheless, his harmonies are never complete. In his plays, evil is unpreventable, losses irrevocable, suffering is certain and unavoidable. His plays propagate the fact that one can learn positive things through suffering as well. The chorus in Agamemnon, the first play of the Orestia, says this point twice. The capacity to learn through suffering is a primary characteristic feature of a tragic hero, especially Greek tragic hero. According to Aeschylus, suffering need not be annoying but can be a source of knowledge. The moral strength of his plays and those of his contemporary tragedians cannot be overstated. Even though it cannot be proved that Aeschylus invented tragedy, it is beyond doubt that he at least set its tone and formed a model that is still effective. Sophocles is regarded as a purest artist as far as tragedy is concerned. It is believed that Sophocles wrote his last play, Oedipus at Colonus at the age of 90. Out of 125 plays attributed to him, only 7 plays survive today. He won the prize in the tragic competitions for nearly 20 times and he never placed himself lower than second. Sophocles is a great intermediary force between Aeschylus and Euripides. Among the three, Aeschylus gravitated to resolve tragic tensions into higher truth, to look beyond or above tragedy. Euripides' irony and bitterness steered him the other way to fix on the breakdown and degeneration of the individual and Sophocles was true to the actual situation of human experience. Sophocles never ingratiated himself into his characters or situations never controlled them into predetermined patterns. He sets his characters free on a path apparently of their own choice. He neither preaches nor complains. If life is too hard and often prone to disappointment, the questions Sophocles raise are definitely not how did this happen or why did such a misfortune happen. Rather, in given circumstances, how must one conduct himself or act or what must one do in those situations? His Oedipus the king served as a representation of his dramatic achievement. The extraordinary dramatic diplomacy, intriguing questions that Sophocles posed in Oedipus the King define the form itself. Aristotle, a century later, analyzed the play 
for his definition of tragedy as mentioned in his poetics. The tragedies of Euripides present in Ardis Manor, the details of the destruction of human lives under the force of gods who often deliberately plays upon them. Even if the gods are not involved, through jealousy or malice, they sit indolently while an individual suffers through fervor or negligence. For instance, in Hippolytus, the goddess Aphrodite never thinks of justice as she firmly believes in taking revenge on the young Hippolytus for neglecting her worship. She acts out of personal ill feelings. The Euripidean gods cannot be urged to in the name of justice. Euripides' inclination towards a neutral stance, a stand between two sides, gods versus humans, leaves the audience in a difficult situation, unable to make a moral decision. In Sophocles, the gods are far away, but their moral supremacy is unquestioned. In Euripides, the gods are disparaging, venting their whimsical wills on the unarmed and vulnerable. For this reason, Aristotle rightly called Europeans the most tragic of the three dramatists. Undoubtedly, his portrayal of human life is very bleak and gloomy. After Europeans, the Greek drama has added little significance to the history of tragedy. Although performances continued to be given in theatres, with the fall of Athens as a city-state, the tradition of tragedy corroded. The strong idealism, the glorious sense of human capacity as depicted in tragedy at its height resulted in more and more complaints of the Nihilists. Gilbert Murray, a 20th century British classical scholar, used the phrase the failure of nerve to describe the late Greek world. However, Friedrich Nietzsche, a 19th century German philosopher, in his book The Birth of Tragedy, published in the year 1972, provided a different clue for the fall of tragedy. Socratic optimism, the idea underlying Plato's thought, know himself, through a constant exercise of reason and careful reason, a belief that deviated the very question of human existence away from drama into philosophy. In any way, tragedy lost its stability and the theatre of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides paved way to a theatre of vituperation, spectacle and amusement. The Roman world totally failed to renew tragedy. Seneca wrote eight tragedies, but most of them were adoptions of Greek tragedies. The prominence was more on rhetoric, making it more melodramatic and bombastic. Roman poets produced great lyric and epic verses, but the tragic drama is deprived of inquisitive originality and openness fundamental of tragedy. With the fall of the Roman world and the invasions of the barbarians gave way for the beginnings of the long yet slow growth of the Christian church. The mass with its daily enactment of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, its music, its theatrical structure provided something close to tragic drama to the people. characteristics of a tragedy. Tragic heroes approach to life, its problems and situations are fair and straightforward. Life is understood in simple equations like good or bad, just or unjust, beautiful or ugly. Tragic plots give more emphasis on order and process. The end follows from the beginning they show low tolerance for disorder. Tragic plots prefer familiar to unfamiliar. They show 
low tolerance for emotional conflict. The violation of a rule brings tragic fall. There is less tolerance for ambiguity in tragedy. In tragedy, things should have only one meaning and should have clear approach to problems. Tragedy leaves more stress on what is past and what is real. It wishes to be more information gathering, wanting to find solutions for agonizing and irritating problems. Tragedy calls the attention for uncritical thinking, that is, tragedy does not bend to call into question the accepted order of things. To do so is to suffer. Tragic heroes respond with strong emotions like arrogance, desire, sorrow, or wrath. This is often the result of extreme attitudes and reactions. The audience is also expected to respond with the same invigorating involvement. Tragic heroes are very stubborn and stick to their path, which leads to their doom. Tragedies long for a vision, a clear-cut world driven by principle. It gives more value to truth, justice and beauty. Tragic vision values human spirit. It gives more importance to spirit than to body. Tragic heroes always crave to be at higher and greater level of life than common human existence. Plots and characters in a tragedy are treated important. Tragic action leads to inevitable situations and final fall. Characters in the tragedy are always above human, semi-divine and larger than life beings. Tragedies often arise from warrior cultures. Its values are often those of good soldier, duty, honor and commitment. Annoying a tragic hero often results in series of venigens. Tragedies often tend to accentuate the noble, upper class and the royals. Tragedies are often male dominated and tragic heroes always support one tradition against the other and uphold the accepted order. Tragedies emphasize on the evil consequences of disobeying the accepted order of the society. Tragedies accentuate the individual and the consequences of the individual's action both on himself, his family and on society. Tragedy has a mix of seven intertwined elements that help to establish what is called tragic vision. They are the conclusion is catastrophic, the catastrophic conclusion is unavoidable. It occurs because of the human limitations the protagonist has. The protagonist suffers very badly. The suffering of the protagonist is always lopsided to his or her responsibility. The suffering is usually extenuating, extracting the noblest of human capability for learning through suffering. In tragedy, the denoma is catastrophic. It is supposed to be the concluding phase of a downward movement. There is an unhappy ending in the tragedy as it depicts the fall of the heroes or heroines fall from fortune to isolation from society often leading to death. Aristotle on tragedy, what Aristotle talks about tragedy. Aristotle defines tragedy as the imitation of an action that is serious and also as having magnitude complete in itself. He further adds, tragedy is a form of drama, exciting the emotions of pity and fear. Its action should be single and complete. Presenting a reversal of fortune involving persons renowned and of superior attainments 
and it should be single and complete and presenting a reversal of fortune involving persons renowned and of superior attainments and it should be written in poetry embellished with every kind of artistic expression the writer presents the incidents that arouse pity and fear to interpret its catharsis the basic difference aristotle points between tragedy and other genres such as comedy and the epic is the tragic pleasure of pity and fear the audience show great interest in watching a tragedy in order the tragic hero stimulate these feelings in the audience he cannot be either completely good or bad but must be somebody whom the audience can always identify with however if he is superior in some way or the other the tragic pleasure is even more strengthened his catastrophic end is an outcome of a mistaken action which in turn arises from a tragic flaw or from a tragic error in judgment often the tragic flaw is imperiousness extreme pride that causes the hero to disregard the divine warning or to break a moral law it is believed that the tragic hero's suffering is more in intensity than his mistake maybe because of this the audience feel pity this happens because the audience keeps their foot in the hero's shoes and believes that they could behave similarly in given situations and hence they feel pity let us now understand what revenge tragedy is all about the revenge play or revenge tragedy is a kind of tragedy in which a murder victim is avenged more often by a younger person from the same kinfolk this results in the death of both the murderer and the avenger this form was first classified by fredson bowers this form of play was popular during the elizabethan and the jacobian eras the best known examples are thomas cutts the spanish tragedy and william shakespeare's the hamlet Revenge tragedy was originally derived from the Roman tragedies of Seneca but it claimed its recognition on the English stage by Thomas Kett with his The Spanish Tragedy. These works feature major themes and techniques like ghosts, madness, procrastination, a play within a play, violence on the stage, bloodshed because of multiple murders, etc. Almost all major playwrights of the time like Thomas Kett, Shakespeare, George Chapman, Thomas Middleton and John Webster contributed their might to this class of drama. It has been observed that early revenge tragedies like George Peel's The Battle of Alcazar and Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus also mirror this unrefined form. However, These tragedies were also a feast for the audience and became repositories of London theatre. Let us understand Elizabethan tragedy. Scholars argue that the Elizabethan tragedy displayed signs of influence by Seneca, a Roman statesman, philosopher, dramatist and an orator. who lived during the 1st century AD. Seneca's works were first translated into English language in 1559 and by 1581 Senecan tragedies were widely popular among the English scholars. While Seneca wrote different kinds of tragedy, the Elizabethan playwrights were more attracted to his Thyestes, Medea and Agamemnon all exaggerate murder. and his loyalty and ensuing search for bloodshed on the villains the plays present passions like hate 
jealousy and love. They also contain sensational elements like supernatural phenomena and bloody violence. Apart from Seneca's influence, the Italian novel provided another source for the revenge tragedy. These Italian plays deal with features like Machiavellian villains and bloody family feuds. Many others believed the influence of medieval contemptuous Mundi tradition. These critics believed that Elizabethan dramatists employed cultural concepts like the dance of death and the restoration of seven deadly sins as a means to connect with an audience that was occupied with volatility and religious loyalty. The cycle of a tragedy can be depicted as follows, good, evil, chaos, death, reassertion of good. The Elizabethan dramatists very skillfully exploited the form of revenge tragedy as they were most sophisticated in treating the motifs, themes and characters. Marston's Antonio's revenge is considered to be a perfect example that skillfully amalgamates all the elements of a revenge tragedy. Marston has very skillfully used the revenge conventions that some even argue that Marston deliberately imitated the popular genre. During the same period, Shakespeare took this genre to its zenith through Hamlet, a drama that is remembered for its plot, characterization and clever reflection of the revenge. Other tragedies of this period that display a keen insight into the moral and spiritual consequences of revenge are Tourneros, the Revenger's Tragedy, Chapman's Revenge of Buzzy the Amboa. Critics have characterized the revenge tragedies of this period as gloomy and skeptical. The gloomy and skeptical statements on the moral and spiritual disorder that emerges from a society that is decayed and morally disintegrated. Webster's The White Devil, The Duchess of Malfi, Ford's It's Pity She's a War, and The Broken Heart and Shirley's The Cardinal belong to this period. Finally, to conclude, tragedy is a works of art which highlight both mental and physical suffering of human beings and arouse catharsis in audience. I hope everybody understood the origin, development and growth of tragedy. Thank you.